covering of the ark. In, in front of the covering of the ark, right? In front of the parochet, in front of the covering for the ark is the menorah. Exactly. Yeah. So in the temple, you had the main area where most of the vessels were was called the Kodesh. It was holy. The place where the ark was is the Kodesh HaKadashim, and there was a curtain dividing the two. Most of the vessels were in front of that curtain. So the ark of the covenant was behind the curtain, and that was something that was hardly ever accessed. But the part in front of the, the parochet, you had there the table with the loaves of bread. You had the 12 loaves of bread on that table. You had one of the mizbeach, one of the altars was there. And one of the very big features over there was this the menorah, the golden um, menorah, as we know, right? that had oil, this Shemen Zayit Zach, this Shemen Zayit Zach, this pure, um, clear crushed oil that was used for, for illumination that was, and it says here, to raise a light continually, right? So what do we know of in our modern day shuls that represent this idea of a continuous light burning? The Ne'er Tamid, right? So in a way, one of the things that I think is lovely is that even though none of us are going to shul at the moment and we're not even looking at the, we, the our safer Torahs haven't even been taken out, but there is one part of the shul that is still there in the same way that it would if we were there or not, and that is the Ne'er Tamid, that is continuously burning, always, always burning. Ooh. Yeah, you need to mute, otherwise we're going to have lots of echoing, I think. Martin, are you okay over there? Yes, yeah, sorry, I wasn't saying anything. I don't know why it says... No, I think it's the, it's the other Martin. Oh, sorry. Yes, so we have... I want to check that. I think he's getting Josie on. That's fine. Okay, so, hello. So that's the, the role of the oil. Now, we all, all know, obviously, that the oil wasn't just lit in the temple, but actually we have it in our modern day um, way of life. We, we symbolize this through Hanukkah. So if we look at the second source, this is the Shulchan Aruch. Now the Shulchan Aruch is the main code of halacha, of Jewish practice, and it explains to us exactly what we need to do. So this is very much, whereas the Mishnah and the Gemara would have a debate about the different halachic um, stances on things, the Shulchan Aruch was the first time really that it was clearly codified exactly what should you do. I always say one of my frustrations with when um, I haven't learned a lot of Gemara, but when I do, one of the things that I find really annoying about it, which some people love, but I always say, could you just tell me what I'm meant to do? Stop telling me what the different opinions are. I just want to know what I'm meant to do. I'll do whatever you tell me, but stop telling me this person said this and this said the other. Explain to me what it means. I, I could be I've told this group before, but it, if, if not, I... I I will repeat it, if not, you can interrupt me. But when we were living in Israel, Elchanan once explained to me a really complex sugya that he was learning, a really complex chapter that he was learning in Gemara. And I said, okay, fine, I'll sit down, explain it to me. Because for months, he was so excited about this part of the Gemara. It's called Takva Kohen, which is when a, a Kohen tries to grab a talit when two people grab it at the same time. So he sat down and he made models even, Amanda will, will know from Elchonen's Gemara Shir and Martin that you know he, he'll try to visualize it for me, he tried to explain it. And I think I must have sat there for half an hour really absorbed in what he was explaining to me. And then I said, so what's the answer? And he said, no, 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 that's not the point. I, he said, we haven't got there yet. And I said, what do you mean you haven't got there yet? You've been discussing this for months where are you going like what, what who does it belong to already and he found that quite amusing but i think that is it is a different style of learning but the lovely thing about the shulchan aruch is it really was the first time that it took all those arguments and gives you almost like the bottom line so if we look on in source number two all oil and wicks are fit for use for the hanukkah light even if the oils are not drawn after the wick and the illumination is not held well by those wicks. The Ramah, which is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch and is the Ashkenazic commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. So the Shulchan Aruch was written by Rabbi Yosef Cairo and he was in the Sephardic world. So he's considered the, the, the primary um, 
code, the, the law that you go according to is the Shulchan Aruch in the Sephardi world. For the most part in the Ashkenazic world, we follow that as well. But there are some times where there's a difference between that Sephardi way of interpreting it and the Ashkenazic way. So over here, the Ramah says, however, olive oil is a choice mitzvah. And you can see the Mardachai, the Kolba, and the Maharil all, all um, yeah, that's where he's drawing his source from. And if olive oil is not available, it is a mitzvah with oil whose illumination is pure and clean. And we have the custom in these countries to kindle with wax candles since their illumination is clear like oil. So I, I'm not going to go into this right now, but one of the interesting things to think about, if you have the choice between lighting a, a form of oil that doesn't give a clear flame or lighting candles, it seems to be from the Ramah, it's preferable to, to light candles, I believe, because the, the point is that you want to have a clear flame. Now our custom, um, everyone has different customs. We do try on Hanukkah to light olive oil. It's so easy nowadays when you can just buy the ready measured out um, oil in the cups with the wicks inside. If you've seen those, you'll know what I'm talking about. They come like in a triangular box that it's ready to go. But it's this idea of olive oil. There is something extra special about olive oil. Um, I actually light olive oil can, um, for Shabbat candles as well. But again, that's a custom. Wax candles are, are, are fine as well. There is something extra special about lighting olive oil. And ol like I said, olive oil does have this extra special um, element to it. But the, really the idea and, and what we celebrate that we know what we celebrate when it's Hanukkah time, but the, the real essence, the real idea over here is what is light? Because whether we're talking about a wax candle or the more ideal form, we're talking about the olive oil, this idea of being able to bring light from something is something that's very, very central and very important. And it's actually an idea that starts from even before we are born. And that's why I wanted to share with you one of, one of the most amazing um, Gemaras that describes what happens to each of us inside the womb. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, really is it something that, that every one of us, what was happening to us before we were born? So if we look over here, we've got a Gemara in Talmud in Nida, and it tells us as follows, that a lamp is lit for the unborn child above his head, his or her head, and with its light, he peers out and sees from one end of the world to the other end. What's interesting is when, when Adam was created, he was described also as having this ability of being able to see from one end of the world to the other end of the world. This unbelievable vision. It's almost like futurist. You can see the past and the future and everything all at once. And what happened when they sinned was this amazing light and vision was actually put away. But what, um, so we, t we talk about this idea of the Arhagonas, this, this bright, incredible light that's much brighter than the light that we now have, much brighter than the light of the sun or the light of, of electricity. We're talking about this incredible eternal light, um, being able to imagine to be able to see from one end of the world to the other end. But what's interesting is that a child in the womb, each of us had that ability. We had the ability to see from one end of the world to the other. And throughout one's life on earth, there are no days on which a person experiences more bliss than during those days in his mother's womb. And they teach the unborn child the entire Torah. So we, we, our tradition tells us um, that there is an angel that's that is there with this eternal light with each of us inside the womb teaching us the whole of Torah and as soon as he emerges into the air of the world an angel comes and slaps him on his mouth which is you're going to remind me what's this part here called anyone remember I know there is a term the the just above your lip there is a there is a medical term for it I can't remember what that part's called but the little indentation that you have between your nose and your lip um, that's where we, our tradition tells us that's where the angel has touched us over there, causing him to forget the entire Torah. Very, Jacqueline, very yes. interesting that when people don't want you to say anything, they put their finger and say shush. 
Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I wonder. It's not just on your lips, it's you do like this, don't you? That is interesting. That is very interesting, Joe. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder. So first of all, has anyone heard of this concept of when of this lamp of, of light um, and, and this ability to see from one end of the world to the other being taught to us when we were in utero and knowing the whole Torah? Never heard it before. Amazing. <laughs> Fascinating, right? I've heard about the being, teach, being taught mm. Torah and then um, being, you know, the angel touching you on the mouth and not and so you forget it but i hadn't heard about the light yeah i think so i think it's i've all... heard it before the gemara report but you don't pick up on all the aspects so sometimes yeah. you have to focus on one particular detail and like 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 the really miriam's also heard the gemara before but you don't pick up on that idea of the light because you're focusing on different things so yeah yeah so a lot of things we can do when we're first born one of the sisters when i had my first child told me if you hold up a baby it will walk you right. know when it's born it can she said it has all the instincts but forgets and then you have amazing yeah isn't that amazing so i've heard stories of people who have had brain surgery i don't know if any of you've heard a story like this that a lady had brain surgery and they touched something in her brain that was connected to memory and she sang an entire opera when she woke up she'd never been to the opera in her life but she said that her mother had when she was pregnant with her and that was a memory oh that word. was in her brain so Oof. you never know i mean we also believe obviously we do believe in the idea of reincarnation but this wasn't this was the 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 memories that are being formed you never know how deeply ingrained they are but my question for all of you is if an angel is going to come and teach you the whole of the torah when you were in utero that's wonderful you now know the whole Torah what on earth is the point if as soon as you are being born you forget it all surely that is a real waste of time no you have to learn well to me it uh, seems contradictory what is the point <laughs> What yeah, it's a good question, isn't it, Martin? Yeah, good. I've heard of people through brain surgery or strokes coming round and speaking in a different language and being quite fluent. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and that was not something that they knew before or didn't realise they oh, knew. No, no. Completely speaking in a in a fluent in a different language. I've not really? I've not come across it, but I've heard of it. I I'm sure I've read it. Yes, I've heard that. Yeah. Surely the whole point in this is that you're supposed to learn Torah yourself. And if you already knew it, uh, you wouldn't have that experience. Yeah, exactly, Martin. So if someone would hand you everything that you need to know on a silver platter, you won't appreciate it. There's an incredible sense of achievement when you work through something and gain it yourself. There really is. It's an amazing feeling. You know, we've all had that, whether it's learning a skill, whether it's learning something in Torah, and when you really put your teeth into it and work through it, it feels amazing rather than when someone just tells you something or something's just handed to you on a silver platter. And I think that that is definitely uh, the reason that we're not born with knowing the whole of the Torah is because actually then it wouldn't feel that it's something special. It's not that um, we say in Pirkei Avot, we talk about Yagata or Matsata, that if you toil in something and you find it, that amazing like aha moment of I tried really hard and I got it. It's an amazing feeling. And I think we would miss out on that if we, if we were just handed it. But even more than that, the question's a little bit deeper than that, because I get the reason that we don't know all the Torah beforehand, but why do we need to learn it in the first place if we're just going to forget it? So I get the re I get I understand why it's not a good idea to be born knowing everything that I do get, even though if you ask some of my children, they probably think that they were born knowing. Amanda's <laughs> laughing because she knows who I mean, but um, that they were born and they do know absolutely everything. But I, I think, think that's once all we was that I think that's all, I think that's all yeah. children. Some more than others, definitely. <laughs> but yes, um, but I think as we mature, we realise actually we don't know everything. Um, <laughs> Yes, but that's what I meant. Why, why, why learn it in the first place if we're going to forget it? And I think one of the reasons for this is, is the, the I, let's call it the deja vu effect. 
have you ever sat in a Torah class and thought, oh, that sounds really like something that's very familiar or something that feels at home for me. It's something that I feel very comfortable with. It doesn't always happen, but sometimes you'll hear a really nice idea and you'll think, oh, I feel like I almost knew that or I feel like that resonates within me. Well, it is because you knew it already. You did. You just forgot it. But when you were in the womb, that's what you were learning. That's what you knew. <laughs> so that, like, like I said, this deja vu kind of concept is something that's very, very powerful for us. Oh, I've missed a lot. Okay. So this concept of light and the importance of light, it's actually... Um, there's a verse brought down in Mishle, in Proverbs, which Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest of all men, right, brings us all different sayings and all different Proverbs that have so much depth to them. This one is, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam Chofesh Kol Chadrei Vaten. The life breath of man, or it calls it the life breath in the, in the, in the translation, but we understand what neshama is, is the soul, I would say even, of man is the lamp of the Lord, revealing all his innermost parts. And again, if you look at the Hebrew, it's like the inside of his stomach, button is, a, is the stomach. It's talking about the real, like, you know, in his kishkas, the kishkas of a person, I think that's what it's talking about. But what does this saying mean that the, the soul of a man is, like the, the candle, the light of God, the lamp of the Lord. Again, we've got this idea of the, the imagery of a lamp that we had above as well. Any ideas? So I think to be able to fully understand this power of light, the significance of light, I think we have to go all the way back to the first time that light is mentioned which is in Bereshit, as we know, right at the beginning, the third verse. And it says, Vayoma Elohim Yehi Ar, Vayahi Ar. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And one of the things that we know about creation, that God created the world through saying things. So it was, Hu Amar Vayahi. God said it, and it was. His saying it makes it be. So when we say, Hashem said, let there be light, there was light. That, that expression created light. And what's interesting is the word ar, the, which is the first time light appears in the Torah, is actually the 25th word starting from the beginning of Bereshit. I don't have my Chumash in front of me, so one of you can quiz me on it. But I believe if you count from Bereshit, if you count 25 words, the 25th word is ar, is light. Why is that significant? It's so much you. The, gam the gamatra value of the no, it was, no, it was about 400. No. 400 no, it's not. It's nothing like about 200 and something, isn't it? So it can't be that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't know. No idea. No. So we, we talk about how different <laughs> concepts are hinted to in the Torah. And one of the things that we have to be able to try to show is where, well, you'll know it from Megillah, actually. We talked about the idea of where um, Esther min ha-Torah min Haman min ha-Torah min ayin, Mardachai min ha-Torah min ayin. The Gemara asks, where can you find Esther in the Torah? And then you've got um, Hastir Aster es Ponai. There's a verse that kind of contains her name. When we're looking for Haman in the Torah, there's a verse that says, Hamin ha And that's to do with um, when when the Adam and Eve first sinned, the idea of Haman being this idea of putting doubt in the world, and Mordechai comes from different herbs. So there's this idea of trying to pin a concept that only came after the end of the Torah, but to pin it onto the Torah. So that's to do with Purim. The other big festival is Hanukkah. And where is there a hint to Hanukkah in the Torah? On the 25th day, right, of Kislev is when Hanukkah is. And the 25th word in the Torah is light. Uh, so it's one of these kind of, you know, ideas of actually the essence of the 25th was light. And it, it, it's interesting because it does fit in as well to do with when the, when the 
um, tabernacle was put up and put down, but that's not going to be our focus of today. But the point is that the Torah does contain everything within it. And in this case, it does talk about light. So, like we said, this light that we're talking about, what's very important to realize is we're not talking about the light that we know. How do we know that we're not talking about the light we know? How do we know that the light, when we say, um, yeah, he are, right, he are, that on the first day of creation, God didn't create the light that I can now see outside my window? Because the sun and moon went, the sun was the, 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 day, fourth, the, the day four of creation. Exactly. We hadn't created the sun. It wasn't until day four that we had the sun. So this light must be something different. And actually going back again to that Gemara in Nizza that spoke about inside the womb, we, clearly the light was something different. And the way it's described is this, the, the light was this ability to see from one end of the world to the other, or to be able to see, we could explain it as well as being able to see from past to future, the whole, the whole of creation in one go, the whole of existence in one go. So this so, incredible light, that's what we're talking about. Because your soul, see the life breath must be like your soul that's within you, that God has given, but yeah. we have to find it, don't we? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's there, but we don't know unless we look, find it. <laughs> have you all seen, there was um, a wonderful cartoon video by Rabbi David Aaron about explaining God with using a lamp. Have any of you seen that? No. If you, if you bear with me one minute, I'm actually going to share it with you because it's a wonderful idea of understanding what God is, but also connecting with, um, with um, this idea of light because they use light as a as a model to show it. Just give me one second. Okay, let's see if I can share this. We're going to try. Let's see how great Zoom is. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So let's say I'm going to share screen now. Yeah, let's try this. This is one of my favorite video clips of all time. Um, because I think it explains such a profound idea in such a wonderful way. Please just let me know if you can actually see it. Do you see light now? Has that come up? Yes. Uh, just There's the word light. Okay. Yes. And I'm going to play the video. Let's hope that it works. I've just got Zoom on mine. Mommy, can I share something? But I promise you won't get upset. Of course. Um, I'm not sure I really believe in electricity. Why, my love? Well, where is he? Electricity is the source and the life of our lives. It's beyond us and he's also within us. But I don't feel him in my life. I mean, he isn't in your life. He is your life. And my life and the life of all. The power of all powers. Electricity is lighting, heating, cooling. You mean electricity is all of us put together? Brilliant question. No, he's not the sum total of all powers. He is one, and we are one with him, a part of him. So electricity breaks up into parts? No, no. We're not a part of him like a slice of pizza. We are partial expressions of him. So we're electricity? Definitely not. Electricity is us, but we're not him. He's infinitely greater than us all. He is forever one and only. And yet through each new electrical device, another limited aspect of electricity is born into the world. You would just believe that? I know that. It's self-evident. Honey, as you get to know yourself, it becomes ever more obvious that you are part of a greater self. But religion is such a turn-off. Look at Freddy. He's an atheist, and he's so cool. Freddy's a fridge. Whether he believes it or not, he's cool only because of electricity. If we're anyways part of electricity, then what difference does it make if I believe or not? Will electricity punish me? Will he blow my fuse? 
We are not punished for our disbeliefs, but by our disbeliefs. When we deny electricity and go against his will, we are really going against what we truly want deep inside. Service is not oppression, but self-expression. Is that why Kobe the Cook Machine had a sign on him that said out of service? Uh Uh-huh. Mommy, what happens to us when we die? Is there light after death? We never die. We just get unplugged and return back to electricity. Huh? Sweetheart, we're not lamps. That's just our bodies. We're light. We come from electricity, and to him we return. Well, what about bad guys? They do evil, but in essence they're not evil. They're just really confused and do bad because they think, this is my power and my strength and I can do what I please. What happens to them when they die? You mean unplugged? Oh yeah. Evildoers are in for a big shock. They too will discover how all along they were a part of him and actually wronged and betrayed their own self. The shame will hurt like hell. So they're going to hell? Hell, nor heaven, is a place. It's a realization. All are destined to know that electricity is the one supreme self. This truth is hell for those who denied it, and heaven for those who lived it. Mom, one more question? No, that's it. This really isn't light bedtime conversation. But I'm so turned on. It's time to get some sleep. Good night, my bright boy. Okay. So first of all, was everyone able to see that? Yes, I saw it. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So uh, the, one of the amazing things about this, which I really think, is it looks like a sweet cartoon, but it actually contains like the whole basis of Jewish philosophy in a, 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 a very sweet way, but a very deep way. I think you could look at every part of it and really try to analyze it. The reason I brought up now specifically is if you think of that pizza model that it showed, when we say that the Kiner Hashem Nishmas Adam, that the light of God is, man's soul is the light of God. We don't mean that you take the light of God. No. Yes, we don't mean that you take the light of God and cut it into pieces, right? We're not talking about God cut into pieces and each one of us have a slice of the pizza, but we mean that he, that his the light of him is what shines through in our soul. And I think that the place you can really see it about this idea of the light is when man was created, mm-hmm. when Adam was created, and in some, according to a lot of the um, interpretations the original person that was created was actually male female together but that's not the point of what we're um, the point i wanted to make here but it talks about the idea that god breathed into adam which again you've got that word for soul neshama this living soul god breathed that into god God breathed that into Adam and the Zohar talks about the idea and it's it's again we spoke a little bit last week about the idea of Lagva Omer but this week it's again we're continuing with the light of the Zohar the Zohar talks about the idea that when somebody breathes out a part of them goes out so if you imagine a person breathing a balloon blowing up a balloon part of your breath your which came from inside of you goes into that balloon so it's almost as if you imagine God breathing into Adam, a part of God went into Adam, part of God's breath went into Adam. So it's, you know, it's, we're, we're an expression of God. That's something that comes from, from this idea. So what I would like to now just focus on is we've been looking the whole way along um, at the seven species in parallel to particularly um, the seven sephirot. And we've also been, some of the time, we've been trying to see how they match with different people as well. Now, um, to do with the Ushpizen. Now, what's very interesting is depending on your Nusach, um, different people have different orders for the Ushpizen. Some people say Yosef and then David, and some people say David and then Yosef, right? We're going to go according to the level that Yosef and then David Right. It's, does anyone remember what order we do, Ashkenaz? I grew up Nusach Sfarad, so I get mixed up sometimes. But I think we say um, Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, Moshe Aaron, Yosef, and David. Unless anyone wants to correct me, let's go with that then. Okay. So, but either way, Yosef is connected to the idea of Yisod, 
which is the idea that is the sixth of the seven sephirot. Yeah. We're now talking about Yusod, and Yusod is talking about the foundation. Yusod is referring to our foundations. So, what does olive oil have to do with Yusod, and what does olive oil have to do with, with Yosef as well? If you remember all the way back to those of you who are with us when we spoke about when we spoke about um, Chesed and Gevurah all the way in the beginning, right? We had Chesed in one hand and Gevurah on the other hand, and they complemented each other. And then we had we had some of the spirit. We said they're almost like the opposites of each other. What we will see with next week's as well is that olives and dates are very, very different. They're almost polar opposites of each other. In what way is an olive and a date going to be opposites of each other? Or Shemen Zayit and Devash, actually to be more accurate, olive oil and honey of dates, how are those opposites of each other? The olive is sharp and the date is sweet. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, you've got the olive is quite a, a bitter taste, actually, even. And the Devash is, is delicious and sweet from the first moment you try it. What's interesting with the olive is in order to get something beautiful or something productive from it, what do we have to do? To crush it. We have to crush it. <laughs> olive oil, more than anything, represents struggle. Mm. Right? Yeah. That's what an olive, the olive represents, the idea of struggle. So I'm going to just read out to you some, some of the material that I found. I didn't add it to the source sheet, but just I want to share with you. For most of us, life is synonymous with struggle. We struggle to forge an identity under the ha heavy shadow of parental and peer influence. We struggle with all different things in our life. We struggle to earn a living, where then we struggle with our guilt over our good fortune and underlying it all is the perpetual struggle between our animal and our godly selves. So we were created as something that struggles. We spoke about this idea of anashama being inside our body. They are actually diametric opposites to each other. One, uh, our body has an animalistic pull to the ground. It's even called that. We're called Adam because we were made from the Adama, from the ground. And at the same time, we have this godly part of us, the Neshama, and they're meant to exist together. <clears throat> that our soul wants to touch the divine. The olive in us is that part of ourselves that thrives on struggle, that revels in it, that would no more escape it than escape life itself. Just like an olive, says, uh, say our sages, which yields its oil only when pressed, so too do we yield what is best in us when pressed between the milestones of life and the counter forces of a divided life. So it's interesting that it's the oil that really represents that idea of when we are crushed, that's when the best part of us comes out. You can see that clearly in the Hanukkah story, right? In the Hanukkah story, you had this idea of what, what did we represent? Who were we? What was really important? And suddenly when we were crushed down to just a few people who were still connected and who still believed, this was what really meant so much to them. Obviously, the parallels we can put in the last century as well, that, that when our people were crushed terribly as a people, but look at what came out of it afterwards. And it is interesting that one of the big symbols by the Knesset is what? Menorah. This massive menorah. That is the symbol of Israel, isn't it? That this massive menorah, the idea that, that you know, when we say Bechol Davrado, they try to destroy us in every single generation. We know, you know, as grandchildren of, for myself as grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, I know this to be so true. But we, we all do, as a people, we know this to be so true. They try to survive us. But look what happened in 48. We're coming up now to Yom Yerushalayim. This idea that, that we now have a state. We have this beautiful menorah for everyone to look at. That's, but what is the point of that menorah? The point of the menorah is to show that we shine the light of God into this world through our struggles. Next week, we'll talk about honey and the beauty of honey and the sweet things and how wonderful that is. But actually, it's through the hardness that the light comes out, right? That's why really, we, the, when we look right at the beginning, the Rama gives us the idea of using the, the olive oil as um, to light the candles. That's the most ideal form of lighting the candles because olive oil really has represents what our people represents, which is through struggle, bringing out light. 
And again, we can connect that back to Lagba Omer last, last week as well. The idea of, you know, the light of Lagba Omer. One of the most amazing things about Rabbi Akiva was that through the darkness, he was able then to start again and bring out light, which I, I believe we, we spoke about last time. What's interesting about Yosef to do with the oil and to do with this connection as well is we we have actually we do know actually that in terms of the direction that history is heading, please God, we're heading towards Mashiach. We do know that there are going to be two forms of Mashiach. You've got Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach the son of Joseph, and Mashiach ben David. And Mashiach ben Yosef, our tradition tells us, will die in war. And then Mashiach ben David will come through. But we do need both of those leaders, Mashiach ben Yosef. What's interesting about the word Mashiach is it comes from this idea of Mashiach, Mashiach, which is this idea of being anointed, of pouring. And what is the way in Judaism that we anoint all of our leaders? We anoint our Kohen Gadol, we anoint our kings is with olive oil. That is what was poured on it, starting from King Saul. That was what was poured on him. That was what was poured on Aaron, the Kohen. We pour oil symbolizing this. And what I didn't realize till we went to the Tower of London, for those of you that have been there as well, is that's part of the, it continued as part of the tradition of when the queen was, um, when she had her coronation, that was part of the procedure as well. It's done behind closed doors. I remember watching the video and they said, this pit you can't see, it's done behind a curtain, but oil is poured onto her as well. Because again, they have the traditions of our Bible. That is how you anoint a king. When we talk about the idea of Mashiach, what we're talking about is someone who is anointed by God. It's so intricately connected to the idea of olive oil. And I think it's so important that we have that co connection. We can also talk about the kingship of Mashiach, right? Melech HaMashiach. We can talk about that next week when we talk about Malchut. But for this week, we're talking about the idea of, of the oil that comes through and that how that connects to um, the 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 idea of the Mashiach being anointed by the oil. And his connection to Yosef is very interesting. Um, I want to read to you two verses. It talks about with Yosef, the Yosef who has shalit al ha'aretz, who ha mashbe l'chol am ha'aretz. Joseph is the ruler of the land. He is the provider for all the people of the land. So it's interesting that Joseph was this idea of being anointed. He was he was the ruler. He was the viceroy for Egypt. He had this um, this um, connection there. And the idea also of um, of being the idea of the concept of Yasod, which is this idea of of the foundation, but it's also the idea of continuity of knowing where we're heading towards. I would say the Sephira that we've spoken about before were things that had happened before. We talked about the idea of Avram and Yitzhak and Chesed and Gevur, and those are concepts we can all connect to. But this is where we're heading towards the idea of Mashiach, the idea of being anointed, the idea of the future, the idea of there being a future. And here, um, we, we again, we've got a verse in Tehillim that talks about Tzadik Hashem b'chol derachav, God is righteous in all his ways and pious in all of his actions. And I think that it's the, the righteousness that we can find from within ourselves is something that can come out of the struggles we go in, through in life. Um, the, the, the idea of connecting to God and connecting to the soul of Hashem, that's this nishmat, nishmat ner Hashem, this light of God that's been put into us, we don't have the same ability to do that as Adam did. We don't have the ability to see from one end of the world to the other as Adam did because that light has been put away. We can tap into it at certain points in our life and certain times in history, like with Hanukkah. We can try to tap into this incredible light, but it's not readily available and easily available for all of us. But actually the time when we can see it is often when we go through struggle. One can of I my just... favorite, yes. I'm just going to say, yes, so it is also the ego. It also represents the ego. And that's another struggle that you have to have in life. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think sometimes in order to let that light shine out, the light of our soul, one of the biggest struggles we have is to get rid of the ego. Definitely, Joe. I think that 
that we almost need to crack that shell to allow our light to shine through. And that's the story that I wanted to share with you. I did, it's not from a Jewish source, but it's probably one of the most, um, the, you know, the, the, the most, the most comforting stories, I think, for myself that I found in life. Um, it's, they tell a story of a little boy who comes across um, a, and I've forgotten the word, a cocoon. There you go. Little boy comes across a little cocoon, which, you know, the caterpillar's tied around itself, this cocoon. It's, it's tightly restricted inside this cocoon. And the little boy seeing the, the, the cocoon and feels really sorry for this poor butterfly. The poor butterfly that's being squished and squashed and really constricted in such a way. And the little boy decides to take a pair of scissors to cut open a little bit the strings just so that the butterfly, sorry, sorry, so that the caterpillar has a bit more space and it's not so constricted and it's not struggling so much. And as we know, what happens to that caterpillar? It comes out as a butterfly that, that's really quite distorted, deformed and isn't able to fly. Because what the little boy didn't understand, which we are able to understand, is actually the struggles that we go through in life, as hard as they are, they are what make us the person that we are. And I think that's why the menorah is the symbol of Israel. And the olive, is really, the olive oil is really something that each one of us can connect so much to, is that those hard things that we're going, that we've gone through or that we are going through, they do shape who we are as a person. They do make us the butterfly that we are that we are constantly becoming i don't think there's a point in life where you've got there i think that's part of life is that we're always that we're always moving right that is life is we're always on a journey and i think every struggle we go through on the way shapes who we are as a person so that's some of the insight that we can take from the idea of the olive oil something that can shape who we are as people ourselves and hopefully next time we'll look at the contrast of that with the dates which like we said that the you, you don't need to go through a process to taste the sweetness or see the benefits of a date you know as soon as you touch it to your lips you can taste how, how delicious the sweetness of the divash whereas the olive you need to really press it down to draw out the beauty within it but the beauty that it makes is the most incredible light and that really is what's signified by the struggles that we go through in our life. So I hope that's given us something to think about and connect to in terms of next time you eat an olive or next time you use some olive oil in your salad, a little bit of a deeper um, take on it. And like I said, the, the, the idea of us being a part of the light of God is something that we should really tap into each of us, but also to each other. We should try to see that godliness in each other. And I think, um, you know, we are definitely seeing that more and more, the goodness in each other, which is a really positive thing. So thank you all for joining us. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And I hope that last, next week will be the last in the series. So I hope to see you next week. Will please God be the normal time again of 12 o'clock. Sorry for the change this week. Okay. Thank you. Have Thank a lovely day. Much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.